If you have a Bible this morning, and you'll read with our scripture reading, we're going to take one from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. We're going to read the first eight verses of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. says, And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sion, and to Og the king of the Amorites, and unto the land of them whom he destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. How to conclude our reading this morning. And if we were to give a title to our thought today, it would be the last generation. The last generation. Um, I may be a little different this morning than, than typical trying to bring the message today. Generally, I try to confine my thoughts to the text as the Lord has revealed it to me throughout the week. Not sure I'll be able to do that this morning, but pray you'll be forbearing with um, how I try to express what the Lord has placed upon my heart. Um, Here in this chapter, we read of an occurrence that happens, um, has happened hundreds, if not thousands of times, I guess the high hundreds, and that is one generation passes the baton to another generation. And as the wise man Solomon instructed us, as we go through life, Things very often feel new. Things very often feel um, unexpected. But truly, as one generation cometh and one generation passes, all the things that we experience have been experienced before. The insecurities, the pains of loss, the fear of what lies ahead the expectations and passings of those that we love, none of it's new. As a matter of fact, it's everything but new. It's happened over and over and over, thousands and millions of times over, and yet to us who have not yet experienced it, it feels new and uncertain. One of those things that has perhaps been upon my mind the last number of months in particular is the fact that the generation that I have been sitting under 
shall soon pass away. I'd like to ask you to do something for me, and this is, if you are 60 and older, would you stand up? If you're 60 and older, yeah. Some of you are at 59, that's alpha close, right? Um, So I want you to look around for a moment. These people will soon be gone. You can interpret that humorously if you'd like, but I don't mean it funny. These people will soon be gone. One by one. And the hard part is that for many of us, many of you, they have always been here. You may be seated. And there is a security in that. Perhaps more than any of us could express. There is a great security. And Sorry. That thought has has been a tough one for me to think about. For a lot of reasons. One of which is, I have, I'm sorry. I have often wondered whether I would be a part of the last generation of faithful Christians in our country. I don't come up here this morning to be pessimistic. Woe is me. I'm just trying to speak from my heart this morning. I've often wondered if that would be the case. And for a big part of my life, I have prayed and still do. But I supposed had this expectation that there would come a moment, a time, where my generation and the generation just above me would get our act together and put the Lord as our first priority. You can, you can interpret this next comment however you would like. I hope you'll do it with grace. About a year ago, in April, I got really discouraged. I'd never been this discouraged before. It wasn't a season that we all go through. I've been through plenty of those, and you have too. It lasted till November. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Things in my life were very good. I had no complaints with things. And the Lord, I think revealed to me what it was. 
I think for much of my life I've thought and I've had these hopes. You hear the word potential. And so you see a young person who's 17, 18, 20, and you, in your mind, you may see them in unsturdy spiritual ground, but they have a world of potential. And you see these flashes of spiritual brilliance emanate from them. And you're prayerful and hopeful that that would become their norm. And in becoming their norm, they would naturally rise up and begin to replace some of these pillar men and women that stood up a few moments ago. I'm at that time of life now where my peers have chosen their course. They're not in the period of choosing anymore. They have laid their foundation where it's going to be. They can move it, but what life experience has taught me is that very few people, once they lay down their roots, ever pull it up to replant again. My peers are getting to the place where they're no longer having children, where their first ones are getting divorced, where I realized many of my hopeful expectations would never be bad. That people with incredible potential to serve the Lord were simply choosing not to do it. And that was not likely going to change. And that was tough. It was very tough. Because what I had thought would come, well, the proverb you've heard me often quote, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You hope in something and it's deferred and deferred and deferred. And eventually your heart gets sick. So each year when we've met for missions conferences here at this church, and I've just prayed, Lord, Inspire this generation however you choose. And for the most part, that has remained unheeded. I'm just being really honest. I'm not saying there aren't bright spots this morning. I sound very pessimistic, but I pray you'll stay with me today. And so, after that, in November, I won't get into the details of my own experience too far, but the Lord began to show me something. And that is that God has called me and each of you, but it was spoken to me, not to try and see the hopes in my heart occur. And strive for those things. But it's rather to just be faithful. Just be faithful. All I can do is pray each week, study God's word, and come before you and do the best that I can to tell you what thus saith the Lord. But I would be lying if I said it's not painful when you preach and by many it goes unheeded. 
that's not meant to be a direct shot at anybody. I'm just speaking from my heart today. And so I've wondered, is this, is this it? Is this, am I going to shepherd the last generation? I say, why? why do you think that? Why do you see that? Well, you know, in Moses' occasion here, and I guess this is trying to bring it all around for our scripture reading this morning. Wow, what Moses had been through, you know. 80 years old, he begins his ministry looking forward. God had prepared him. And he goes and he takes this group of slaves, both in body, and we come to learn as they get out to the wilderness, also in mind, they were slaves. And he tries to lead them. And there are rebellions, apostasies, there's coups, there's building idol gods, there's just the most flagrant disregard for who God is and what He does among the people. And yet Moses remains faithful. He just tries to do what God has led him to do, and that was to take this people, provide them a law, and take them to the land of promise. But because of their unbelief, the Bible teaches us, they entered not into the land of promise. And so they wandered aimlessly for 40 years. I've said before, I cannot think of anything more hellish on earth than to roam in this life aimless. Just filling the time, just passing it with nowhere to go. Here, it has come to the end, and you'll notice what Moses said. He says, I'm 120 years old. I can't come out before you any longer. A lot of those that stood this morning, if we just acknowledge reality for what it is, they just can't do what they used to be able to do. I know that pains them, and it pains me to watch it. That that strong singing voice that would shout the praises of God, just can't do it anymore. That sharp mind that sat with Sunday school children, opened their heart and out came the word of God, just can't do it anymore. That voice that proclaimed God's word, just can't to the same degree that he was once able. And that's a painful thing. And yet, we find that as painful as that is to our generation, there is a sort of celebration at the same time. That in their generation, they were found faithful. They served, as the psalmist put it, their generation which is what God called them to do, was to be found faithful serving their generation. And in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, there's a a picture, which I'm not going to extrapolate it the way Ezekiel does, but talks about standing in the gap. So think of a city that's fortified all the way around, and yet there's just one place where there's a gap. You don't need an opening a mile wide for the enemy to enter. All you need enough is for one man to go through. And so the Bible says this in Ezekiel chapter 22, and it's speaking of intercessory prayer, but he says, he looked and sought, God sought after someone 
to fill the gap. And he found no one in all of Jerusalem to stand and fill that gap. So I ask you as we see we have more than one gap coming forward, right? Like forthcoming very soon in this body and in bodies throughout the United States just like us. There are not just going to be one gap, but many gaps littered throughout our wall and our generation. And we have had the immense privilege to stand within the safety of that wall and benefit from the sacrifice and the diligence and the hard work and the commitment and the love and the character integrity of those that are faithfully standing at the gap. And perhaps it's caused us to think, perhaps it's caused us to underappreciate The demand that was not only theirs, but is soon to be ours. And that as we have leisurely enjoyed the safety that we didn't even recognize that we had. Now, the watchman's voice, the watchman's ability to blow the trumpet is no longer there. And so he seeks out a man or a woman to stand in this body of people. At this church, to fill the gap that will be left by so many. And I ask you today are you faithful to stand in the gap? It is not about being present. It is not about observing their religious duties that they have performed week in and week out. It's a condition of the heart. If I were to describe those most influential spiritual people in my life, it's not about what they did. What they did was a byproduct of who they are. And so it didn't matter what sermon specifically they preached. It was the manner and the love and how it it came out. There was a a distinct different about it that I, I can never, I feel so foolish when I try to explain things. Here recently I was trying to explain to somebody about Henry Smith, an old preacher who taught this lesson about doing mission work. And I tried to explain to them why it was so heartrending, and I couldn't. And I've thought with my children before, with some of you, as Callan is just two years old, how will I ever explain to him them? And I will list off these vague qualities, and I will describe these three or four experiences, and yet it will never relate in full the fullness of the effect of that person upon me. So what does Callan need? Well, he doesn't need reminiscent stories of all of you. He needs people just like these people with the same heart as these people who I can say, you know, this person that I've told you about before, they're a lot like that one. That's what's needed. Moses got to a place, and notice this, Moses said, I'm 120 and I can't do any longer what I want to do. But then he goes on a step further and he says, and God has told me I'm not to do what I used to do. You see, long before a generation passes, God is preparing the next generation to take the leadership before the other generation is gone. 
Now, maybe this is an incorrect way of thinking of it, but I realize that I'm the pastor of this church, and I'm the leader of this church. But there are men, elder men, in my circle of mentorship that in my mind are leaders above me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like when they speak, I don't do what they say, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting there saying, well, as the pastor, I need you to tell me what to do. But there is this collective source of wisdom and experience and spirituality that although I know at the moment I'm the one standing in the gap, I feel this significant dependence and need to have help in doing what I am doing. And it, as I do it, I have this comfort knowing that just a phone call away, just a mile away, just a visit away, are these men and women which can help bolster and strengthen. And I'm saying that slowly dissolve. It's going away. And the thought that has crossed my mind very much recently is the next 35 years of my life are going to be much different than the last 35 years of my life. Because the last, I have been subsidized by the collective wisdom and my dependence upon those above me. And so when I get to places of confusion, when I get to things that I don't know what to do, even when they don't have new wisdom to grant me, their presence and confidence alone is enough. It's enough. They don't solve my problems. But sometimes they breathe the confidence in me to depend on God to solve the problem. And I look and I say, okay, Lord. I know the upcoming generation is going to need that. And I look around at us and our generation, 60 and younger And I see successful people. I see skilled and talented people. I see good people. But the spiritual concern and depth is simply not there. So when my son, like I did, you know, when I had some crucial decisions that I had to make the last people I wanted to go to is my parents, right? That's just how stubborn, prideful kids are. And so when I'm 18 and 20 and 22 and 23 years old, I'm going to go to anybody but my parents. And praise God, I had these people I could go to with such crucial life decisions that I had no idea at the moment would forever affect my life. And now I look back and I say, man... I was spoiled with so many people that took their time and listened. We're not condescending, did not direct the conversation to them and their experiences, but invested in me. And at times, Invested spiritual things that I didn't even know they were doing. And the reason is because I saw, no doubt as you see, that as this world goes on, and as our nation And our world is so rapidly changing faster than you can blink. I am dizzied with the spiritual battles that lie ahead. 
Like, it just boggles my mind to think about, you know, the new thing, artificial intelligence. All the spiritual obstacles and stumbling blocks that's going to create, I think people have no idea. They just don't. It's going to be something that influences our life probably more than we could speak. And what is not needed is the philosopher or the, or the wise man to tell us what we, we need to do and how we need to handle it. We need people who have been touched by the Spirit of God. And as it was said about Daniel, whenever they were throwing that great party and they began to describe Daniel, it said he has the power of the gods in him. They didn't know what they were talking about. All they knew was that of all the wise men of Babylon, there was one man who had the wisdom of the gods or of the one true God. And yet, I ask you, are you spiritually mindful of these things? Like You might be mindful of these things. You might be thinking about how, you know, there's some conspiracy theory and you might be a big prepper and prepping for the end of the world and you might have some clever interpretation of what needs to be done to salvage everything. But are you spiritual in your assessments of where to go from here? Does God speak to you? Joshua, excuse me, Moses says, you're going to go into this new area and there's going to be battles. You know, the... I think about seeing Brother Moran there. I think, you know, when he first started preaching, if somebody would have came and told him one of the greatest adversaries in America to silencing Christianity is gender ideology. That would have seemed make-believe. So what about us? What seems make-believe to you today? Does preachers being imprisoned seem make-believe to you? Probably. We've lived with unparalleled freedom for 400 years now. It probably seems fake, doesn't it? It probably seems like a fear tactic that a preacher might speak of days gone by. What about not being able to meet in our facility that we've invested in for, what, 150 years? Does that seem far-fetched? Does that seem some distant place far, far away? Just like gender ideology did to Brother Moran 60 years ago, right? And yet what gives us the knowledge of what to do in these moments? Well, the Bible teaches us. Not our own ideas. Complete dependence on the Spirit of God. Did you know trusting God takes practice? Did you know that? You don't one day wake up, get persecuted, and then suddenly start trusting God like a spiritual giant. Just like Callan will grow day by day and it's unobservable to the naked eye, so will you spiritually when you pursue Christ. You don't even realize that those things that once tied your soul in knots is now no longer an obstacle to you at all. One day you just wake up and you say, man, why did that bother me for so long? Well, because you were immature in faith. And after the pursuit of God and His Word and the gathering of His people, you grew and praise God, you Those things that you were not able to climb over, now you crush with your foot because you've grown spiritually. And that growth is palpable to someone who is pursuing God. 
You can't say that you're growing because you can observe it, but you can feel a sense in which your faith is more than what it was yesterday. And as obstacles, listen, the obstacles that Moses faced, primarily two enemies, was going to be faced tenfold by Joshua over the course of over 30 years. Joshua was going to enter the promised land and all they were going to do is fight and fight and fight. And he was going to be a man of blood and war. Moses wasn't that. He didn't fight to get out of Egyptian bondage. God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. He went up to the mountain and he got along. But Moses was a leader that was very unique to his time. But the qualities that Moses had, his dependence upon God and his willingness to pursue God and obey him at all costs was inherited by his young, uh, the one that was under him, Joshua. And the Bible teaches us that whenever Moses was, was doing these things, that Joshua at a young age became his aid following him and watching him. And what mattered was not what Moses was doing, but the man that God was making him to become. Because the battles he would face would be altogether different, but it's the same spiritual qualities that look like Christ that cause us to conquer what is ahead of us the same way that those that have come before us conquered what is behind us. Faithfulness, humility, courage. Isn't that what he talks about here? Courage. He advocates to them in verse 6 and 8. I love what he does here. I'm going to begin to try to close. Bear with me for a moment. He says this in verse 6. Be strong and have a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now I'm going to say something that I don't want you to interpret arrogantly. You may do that. I wish you wouldn't. In my life today, I have more faith in God than I ever have in previous parts of my life. What I mean by that is this. I have seen him and his faithfulness through his word in my own life more clearly today than I ever have. And I stand and marvel at who he is. Like it just, I can't tell you how often, periodically, I begin to just think about who God is and all the things that he's done and all the power that he has. I just think, Lord... I can't even fathom you. But thank you. And so, in knowing God better, I have more hope than I ever have because it's in Him. And I know Him better than I ever have. And at the same time, and I don't know how to explain this, I also understand that God bringing about good he often leaves that conditional upon us. In other words, this. We want God to be with us, right? We want to feel his presence in our services. We want to see him change the lives of our young people, right? We all want to see that. I don't doubt that every person in this room wants to see this. And yet, how diligently do we pursue that? And so God is ready and able He's as powerful as he's ever been to touch the lives of our children and grandchildren and those that are right now oriented on their own selfish ambition. Did you know in just a moment, God, like he did with Lydia in the book of Acts, can open their heart, change their orientation to, to, to cause them, to provoke them, to have a desire, not just to kind of make remedial changes of a menial nature, but rather to give them an insatiable thirst to pursue him with all of their life. God alone has the power to change that erring, disengaged young person. And I think very often, it's just my opinion, he withholds that because what he's wanting to see in his people 
is a desire in us to see that come to pass among us. He wants to see desperation. He wants to see people not having to poke and prod for you to pray and study your Bible and come to church and do a... Listen, I don't want to be a policeman. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to call you and say, where are you at? Because I'm saying, hey, you got to get back here. No, God doesn't want people who are coerced to follow him. God wants humble hearted servants who say, I want him more than all else. And I'm going to pursue him above all else. God visits people like that. This morning, he goes to the leaders. I want to say this and I'm done. Our culture has feminized masculinity terribly. And so many men are afraid of confrontation, are afraid of speaking truth, and for fear of how people will respond, are terrified to have an opinion about what we need to do, and where we need to go. But listen, this church needs male leaders. Men. You might say, well, I'm not a deacon. You might say, well, there are other deacons that are older than me. You might say, all these number of excuses, all I'm going to say is this. We need spiritual men who are not leading from behind, waiting for somebody else, who come to the forefront and in humility say this, you know, I'm not perfect. And there's going to be a lot of flaws you find in me, and there's going to be times where I accidentally lead us astray. But I know that God has called me to lead. If you come to church because your wife nags you, you're not a spiritual leader. Right? If you, listen, we have a lot of people in need right now. I'm going to say some things, and I don't, as much as I can, I don't mean them in any bad way. We have a lot of people in our church in need now. We have a lot of things in our church that we've even voted to do in business meetings that are not done. Why aren't they done? People need to stand up and lead. It's just true. I think the reason is we're all busy. We're all busy. And the Lord's house has lied in the waste. And every day that that pushes back, where people are not standing up, you don't have to be voted in to following the Lord. You don't. You don't need to be voted in to following the Lord are not some of the most influential people in this church ever and in your life ever, not people who were formally put there, but were spiritual people that just assumed responsibility because God gave them the responsibility. So here's what he does here. He says this. He says straight to Joshua, God has called you also to go into the promised land with these people. So be strong and of good courage. Here's what I'll tell you about being a leader in a church. It is extremely scary. Everything about it is scary to me. Standing before you is scary to me. Do you know why? If I say one sentence, it's off. It'll be your afternoon conversation. That scares me. It can be. I don't say it will be. It can be your afternoon conversation. If I don't attend to everybody's needs, I struggle with feelings of inferiority, feelings of failure. I worry about being enough for the Lord. Like whether a sermon is, Lord, I tried. And I know one day I'll be held accountable for what I've said before these people. It's scary. 
What about somebody who's gotten a terminal diagnosis and you're sitting there looking at them? What do you say? What about somebody who has an erring child that's rebellious and their heart is crushed and broken? And they're looking to you for comfort. What do you say? What about somebody struggling deep with depression and is suicidal? What do you say? What about somebody who has so many relational and family issues that untangling that web would take a thousand years? What do you say? What do you do? Did you know that God has called many of you to be spiritual leaders in this place to these people? And you'll struggle with all of those things I just mentioned and more. Here's what I've learned about all of that. You know what you do? You don't, you don't read books. You can. They're helpful sometimes. You don't go ask older men and women, what do you say when you're in this situation? You know what you do? You trust the promise that God gave to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage, for I will never leave you or forsake you. And so you go to that church member who's been out of church for 30 years because God gave you a burden. We didn't make any decision in business meeting. The deacons didn't talk about it. None of that happened. God just placed it on your heart. And as a spiritual leader, you know what you did? You were strong and of good courage. And of your own accord, being prompted through love, you knocked on a door. And here's what I found in those moments when it's not certified by the church and it's not an obligation or a duty given to you by something. You know what oftentimes happens? God in those moments gives you such a profound peace and love that's difficult to explain. And you're not thinking about all the what ifs they could say and how you're going to respond. But you're there, and as you're driving there, you know what begins to happen? God begins to fill your heart with love for that person and thinking about all the reasons why they not might be at church and all the pain that they may have experienced and all the needs that they might have. And you show up, and you're already in tears because you love the person. And guess what? That interaction is altogether different than what you could have ever imagined beforehand because God is with you. Spiritual leaders. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. Timothy was one. You know that? You know what Paul told to Timothy? Don't despise or look down on your youth. But be thou an example to the believer. You may be a young Christian this morning. What? Probably Marley or Becca or two of our youngest members here this morning. Maybe God's calling the two of you to do something. Be strong and courageous this morning. I'll say this in closing. Our church is going through changes, whether you see it or not. Things are going to be changing. They just are. And they always have been. People come, people go. But the Lord is with us if we want him to be. I hope this morning you know that the spirit of this message was as rooted in love as I possibly could. I, wanted, I tried to preach on Romans 1 this morning to get out of it. All right? That was my plan B. Um, but I couldn't shake away from saying these things this morning, and so I pray you would, you would hear it.